Hey everyone, so tonight I'm going to be going over a couple different topics. Um, if you're not wanting to really go with non-witchy stuff, it's perfectly fine. That's, you know, what I usually have. But with things going on, I'm going to be doing a couple more things more on the history of Chicanos and Mexicans and the injustices of them. So first I'm going to go over how the United States stole about half of Mexico. Uh, why Christopher Columbus should be disgraced in history. Chicano injustices, the Brown Berets, how Mexicans who served in the U.S. Army, in the U.S. Army, were then deported to Mexico afterwards. As well as when the media talks about Latinos and Hispanics in a positive way, but when it's negative, they call them Mexicans half the time when they're not really half Mexicans, or they'll actually look into what they are and go through nationality. As well as how still indigenous people are not being cared for and the missing murder indigenous women. Um, I'll be going over a couple more things, but that's the main parts. Did you know until 1848, California, New Mexico, and other parts of the Southwest were actually parts of Mexico? Until the U.S. decided to steal it and start a whole war for it and pretty much fuck up everything. So when people say, go back to your country and how, you know, they're illegal in those areas, they're not. So prior to 1822, Mexico was still as well as Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, California were all still Spanish colonies. Um, once 1822 happened, there was a revolution similar to the American Revolution where they rebelled against Spain and then finally got their independence. From there, in 1844, James Polk campaigned to the U.S. to become the next president and to basically take over parts of Mexico. And in February 1845, that's when he got inaugurated and started all these problems. Just so you guys can see uh, kind of like how big it used to be before and after all this, I'm going to pop up a picture of the U.S. and Mexico um, countries separate before um, they were stolen. So you can see right here just how much the size difference is from before and this is now. So, back to James Polk. During his inauguration night, he talked to his Secretary of the Navy, and their principal objective of his presidency was to have the Inquisition of California, which Mexico multiple times had told the U.S. they were not going to sell. And they kept bugging about it and kept asking even higher prices and stuff, and Mexico said no. So, do you know what they did? They started a whole fight to then start the war. Now, you may be wondering how this all started. The Washington Union expressed to the position of James Polk and writ, wrote down, um, who can arrest a torrent that will pour onward to the west? The road to California will be open to us. Who will stay to march? A corpse of properly organized volunteers would invade, overrun, and occupy Mexico. So this is them literally planning to have a group of people come to Mexico to then start problems. And then from there, they would enable us not to only take California, but keep it. So that's literally what they had for plan. So then, pretty much, so then from there, James Polk told Texas that they would help with the support of the Texas-Mexico border being moved from Nuecas River down 150 miles south to the Rio Grande, which is where it's at now, provided Texas agreed to join the Union. So that would mean they would become part of the U.S. From there, they pretty much... Now, from there, in June 30th, 1845, James Polk ordered troops to march south to the traditional Texas border and into the Mexican habit territories, causing Mexicans to flee to the, from their villages and ban their crops in terror. Again, how would you feel if you're just working at your home, you're doing what you need to do, you're working on your crops, and then soldiers come in and try to attack you guys and scare you guys off from your own, like, uh, village. So, ordering troops to the Rio Grande into t uh, territory inhabited by Mexicans was clearly a provocation. Zinn um, said this. So, from there, President Polk had incited the war by sending American soldiers into a disputed territory historically controlled by the inhabitants of Mexico. Then, from there, in early 1846, Colon uh, Colonel Hitchcock, commander of the 3rd Infantry Regiment, writes in his diary, The United States are the aggressors. We have no p uh, particle of right to be here. Again, their own commander said in his diary, The United States are the aggressors. We do not have one particle of right to be here. It looks as if the government sent a small force on purpose to bring a war. So, as to have a pretext for taking California as much of the country as they choose. My heart is not in this business. 
Then, in May 9th, 1846, uh, President Polk told his cabinet, up to t- this time, we have heard no open aggression to the Mexican army. Then, in May 10th, 1846, the next day, violence erupted between Mexican and American troops south of the Nueces River. Of course, Polk claims Mexicans had fired their first shot, but in his famous spy resolutions, Congressman Abraham Lincoln repeatedly challenged President Polk to name the exact spot where Mexicans had first attacked American troops, but he never met the challenge. Then, in May 11th, uh, the president urged Congress to declare war on Mexico. From here, we can see how the U.S. thought about Mexico. Horace Greenlee, in 1846, May 12th, wrote in the New York Tribune, We can easily defeat the armies of Mexico, slaughter them by the thousands, and pursue them perhaps to their capital. We can conquer and annex their territory, but then what? Who believes that a score of victories over Mexico, the annexation of half her provinces, will give us more liberty, a pure morality, and a more prosperous industry? So, they thought that it would be a great idea to take half the country of Mexico, and thought that they would be so much better than us, and pretty much, like, would defeat us, and then it wouldn't even be an actual battle, which is something really irritating to read when you're of Mexican descent. Like, seriously. So, Congressman Abraham Lincoln speaking in the session of Congress, the president unnecessarily and unconstitutionally commenced a war with Mexico. A marching army into the midst of a peaceful Mexican settlement, frightening their inhabitants, leaving their growing crops and their property into destruction. You may even appear perfectly amicable, peaceful, or unprovoking procedures, but it will not appear to us. After war was underway, the American press comments. February 11th, 1847, the Congressional Grove reports, We must march from ocean to ocean. We must march from Texas straight to the Pacific Ocean. It's the destiny of the white race. It is the destiny of the Anglo-Saxon race. New York Herald, the universal Yankee nation can regenerate and disthrall the people of Mexico in a few years. We believe it is part of our destiny to civilize this beautiful country. And the next one up wrote that Mexicans yielding to a superior population and sensibly oozing to her territory. That's what I was saying about the American Review writing about Mexico. To yielding in a superior population, intensively oozing into her territories, changing her customs and outliving and exterminating her weaker blood. In 1846 to 1848, the U.S. Army battled Mexico, not just enforcing the new border, but capturing Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, Colorado, and California, as well as marching south into Mexico City. Then, in 1848, Mexico surrenders to the U.S. terms, taking ownership of these um, places, and getting a payment of $15 million just to make things even out, apparently. And they put in the report, We take nothing but conquest, thank God. Ulysses S. Grant calls the Mexican War the most unjust war ever undertaken by a stronger nation against a weaker one, one that had recently gotten its independence. And now a little earlier than this about Christopher Columbus and how he's a disgrace to the history of both Europe and America. So, as everyone knows, they always talk about how Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue on the Santa Maria, the blah blah blah, you know, the story. And how he was so nice to the Indians, and how nice he was here, and you know how they colonized and found the Americas. He raped, he pillaged, he murdered. He was a disgrace. He ended up taking longer than he was supposed to to get here. He actually was not even liked in Spain when all this happened. And you're going to find out why. Like the other section I did, I'm going to be putting the sources at the end of the whole section of videos. So, number one, Christopher Columbus kidnapped a Caribbean woman and gave her to a crew member to rape. So, this is actually quotes from the person who was during the second expedition of the Americas. While I was in the boat, I captured a very beautiful woman whom Lord Admiral Columbus gave to me. He specifically says that he had taken a rope, whipped her soundly, so badly that she screamed and you would not believe your ears. Eventually, she came to my terms, I assure you, that she would have thought that she had been brought up by a school of whores. So, they literally raped this woman, whipped her, 
and tied her up until she submitted to this guy. What the fuck? Number two. In Española, a member of Christopher Columbus's crew publicly cut off an Indian's ear, Native American, to shock the others into submission. There were three top leaders they got, and then they had cut their ears, whom Columbus then ordered to have them publicly beheaded. Ojeda had ordered his men to grab another Native American to bring him into the middle of the village and cut off his ears in retribution for the Indians failing to help the Spaniards when founding a stream. So, yeah, it's another one. Number three, Christopher Columbus kidnapped and enslaved more than a thousand Españolas. According to Cuneo, Columbus ordered 1,500 men and women to be seized, letting 400 go and condemning 500 to be spent in Spain, sent in Spain, another 600 to be enslaved by Spanish men, remain on the island, and another 200 to 500 to be sent to Spain, died on the voyage, and were thrown. Number four, Columbus forced the Native Americans to collect gold or they'd die. So he had ordered every Indian over 14 to give a large quantity of gold to the Spanish or pain or death. So, those in the regions without much gold were allowed to give cotton instead. Participants in the system would then be stamped copper or brass to wear around their necks to become the um, symbol of intolerable shame. Around the same time, with Mexico, they would actually brand the Native Americans and brand the slaves. Great. Um, Number five, about 50,000 Native Americans committed mass suicide rather than comply with the Spanish. 50,000 Native Americans would rather kill themselves than work for the Spanish. Does this not make sense? They destroyed their stores of bread and neither would give the invaders to eat. So if they'd starve, number six. 56 years after Columbus's first voyage, only 500 Españolas were left out of the 300,000 that used to be there. 500 out of 300,000. Do you understand this? That's less than 1%. Looking it up, 500 out of 300,000 is 0.16%. They nearly eradicated that whole Native American tribe. Seriously. And people want to have this guy be someone who's great. You know, I just, I don't get it. I really don't get it. And while you're at it, he wasn't good with the Spanish either. He was the ruler of some Spanish settlements where he was also brutal to them. He had ordered at least a dozen Spaniards to be whipped in public, tied by their necks, and brought together by their feet. Why? For trading gold for food to avoid starvation. He ordered women's tongues to be cut out for having spoken ill of the admiral and his brothers. Another woman was stripped and na- na- uh, stripped naked and placed on the back of a donkey to be whipped as punishment for falsely claiming to be pregnant. He ordered Spaniards to be hanged for stealing bread. He had a cabin boy's hand hand nailed to public to the spot where he had pulled a tarp from a river to catch a fish. He had ordered one wrongdoer to relieve at least 100 lashes, which could be fatal for stealing sheep, and another one for lying about an incident. An unlucky fellow named Juan Moreno received 100 lashes for falling, failing to gather enough food for Columbus's pantry. And oh look, he sold nine and ten year old girls into sexual slavery. So not only was he a rapist, a oh, just all these things, but he also trafficked children. Yes, let's have these statues of this guy up. Um, this one admitted himself in a letter to Doña Juana de Torre, a friend of the Spanish Queen. There are plenty of dealers who go out looking for girls. Those who are nine to ten are now in demand. For all ages, a good price must be paid. Again, you really want to have a statue of a guy who trafficked children. (laughs) Not only did he do these things to the Native Americans and the slaves and killed people for these things and pillaged their lands, he also, you know, was trafficking children. But yes, let's definitely, again, have that statue up. Next one up would be the slaves, the Native American slaves who were beheaded when they couldn't untie them. Benjamin Keene, a historian of the Spanish conquest of the Americas, noted that multiple sources confirmed accounts of exhausted Indian carriers chained by their neck, whose heads of the Spaniards severed from their bodies so they might not have to stop and untie them. So if they're tired, yes, sure, let's just cut their heads off. So, 
you know what's even crazier about this is that this is something you can easily find with just a couple searches. Just a couple searches. But again, let's keep a statue of a rapist, someone who pillaged, someone who sold children to sex slaves, someone who murdered these people and would just even his own he even would hurt his own and again you want this to be a statue that's up it's something that you're upset about but yes let's keep telling people that you know he discovered the americas on the ocean blue so next one up is the chicano movement which started in the 60s now chicanos are people who are of mexican descent they are in the United States. They were born in the States. Uh, many times these people don't actually know their language, their original one, because during the 60s and 70s, up until kind of recently, um, they weren't allowed to speak their language. They would actually get in trouble in school. They'd get hit in school. They would be made not to speak the original language, so they only knew English. So now with the second generation would be their kids. Many of them don't know um, Spanish, don't know about their culture, don't know about their history, and are very whitewashed. So that's what mostly Chicano is. Um, nowadays, it's something that we as, uh, you know, Latinos, Latinas, Latinx people have taken back as, you know, our thing. And um, yeah, so I'll be going over the Chicano movement. So the 1960s were, you know, a difficult time for the American history um, between the conflicts of civil rights, the Vietnam War, Mexican-American civil rights movements was one of the least studied social movements of the 1960s. You'll hear about the political injustices of um, African-Americans, obviously Vietnam, and, you know, just the hippie movement and such, but you won't hear about the Chicanos. So, there is a wonderful documentary called Chicano, History of the Mexican-American Civil Movement, which I'll be linking um, at the end of the videos which is a four-part documentary series talking about this. Um, mainly goes over, you know, the history of um, just, you know, how bad it was for Chicanos. The whole Chicano movement started in New Mexico with Reyes Lopez Tijanera and the land grant movement, which was paid up by Rodolfo Corky Gonzalez in Denver, who defines the meaning of Chicano through his epic poem, I am jo Joaquin, embracing Cesar Chavez and the farm workers turns to the struggle of the urban youth and culminates into a growing political awareness participation de la raza unida party. So part one is mainly examining the beginnings of the movement by profiling Reyes Lopez de Janena and the land grant movement in 1966 and 1967. It shows how Tijanera's fight to convince the federal government to honor the Treaty of Guadalupe from 1848, 1848 galvanized Mexicans and Mexican Americans across the Southwest. Then it moved to discuss Rodolfo Corky Gonzalez and his founding crusaders of justice in 1966, focusing on the importance of his poem. This segment is very useful for discussion of the Chicano nationalism through its affirmation of our cultural identity, grounded in the Aztec myths of Atlan, which is the mythical Chicano homeland, which is in Mexico. Um, the story being that uh, Aztlan was where we were from, and we went all the way to Mexico City, um, with, you know, the eagle on top with eating the snake and how that happened to be. There are a lot of videos explaining um, this mythical story as well as you can just look it up really easily. But this is something that's very strong to us. Um, that's why, like, you know, you'll see Mexicans say Chicano be very proud of our nationality and our lineage and our cultural identity because there's so much that is, you know, important to us that, yes, a lot of it was lost because of the Spaniards, but a lot of it, a lot of it we were able to keep through oral traditions and our customs which have been transferred here to the U.S. as well. Um, you know, like Dia de los Muertos being Day of the Dead has been a big thing for us in the Mexico. The second segment is the struggles of the fields, examining the importance of Cesar Chavez and his efforts to organize farm workers in the Central Valley of California. Um, it delineates the various components of his strategy, from the farm worker self-determination, wanting to work and trying to get a better life for themselves through strikes, boycotts, pilgrimages, fasts, and emphasizing his commitment to nonviolence and his importance of faith and prayer of achieving his goal. Um, again, it was mainly about, you know, trying to get equal rights for the workers that were, you know, farming everything for everybody else, um, having them, you know, get fair wages, 
um, fair, more fair conditions, not having to work in the heat without, you know, basics. Um, again, if you want to look more about it, you can easily just look up Cesar Chavez, Cesar Chavez and the struggle in the fields. Um, and you'll find more information on him looking up in California. The part three to that, um, documentary is taking back the schools. The best part, honestly, I would think as well from the other parts, uh, it covers the Los Angeles high school blowout of the 1968 throughout the passion. It's also most interesting because the students witness at their young age how to forcefully educate for change. Also striking because the catalyst for the walkouts and high dropout rate, crumbling schools, lack of Mexican-American teachers still resonates today. Um, this is somewhere where you can see just as like the African-American communities, um, the schools weren't as good. Uh, they weren't giving as much education. Many places they had, you know, older books. Um, there's a really good movie, I have to look it up, of a teacher. It's actually based on a true story of a teacher who worked in one of these areas where a lot of Latino kids were there and, you know, they just weren't getting the things they needed and would be called like miscreants and troublemakers just because they didn't have the information. And finally, part four, uh, fighting for political power, discussing the creation of La Raza Unida Party, the United um races party as a third party forcing for political power and the importance of political rights it culminates in 1972 election with the raza unida convention and the fragmentation of the party at the height of the membership recognition pretty much talking about how um unfortunately they couldn't get everything together to stay together for a long time um each part is an hour long so again it does take time to watch it all but i really do think this is something that people should watch um, to educate themselves and just in general not just non-people of color people of color should do it too especially Chicanos like we need to learn more about our history about our culture and you know the struggles that our parents and grandparents had for us to have the rights we have now and then what we need to do for our future children and grandchildren to have better rights than what we have right now like this is something that's really interesting for instance um the inequalities of voting rights in Texas along with the history of any unequal distribution of political power in Crystal City, Texas, the birthplace of La Raza United Party. Despite the fact that Mexican Americans made the majority of the population in the city, not one of the Mexican descents held political office. Chicano is a very good explaining plight of Mexican Americans historically during the Chicano movement. Uh, it does a keen sense of what, what it was to have brown skin in the 1960s. One interview, for example, remembers a farm worker's thought of as ignorant, lazy, stupid, and dirty. In another segment, a second interviewee recalls that being Mexican was a burden. Mexican-Americans were not respected, and they were treated as second-class citizens. Um, as many of the documentaries, you know, you got to make sure you research behind it. But again, this is something that was supposed to help explain our struggles as Mexican-Americans in the U.S.